Welcome back to this course, Functional Genomics. So, uh, you know, in the previous uh, lecture, we are discussing about how the genome editing tools have really helped us to engineer the genome in a wide variety of species. So, we are going to continue the discussion and see what are the other ways by which you are able to uh, engineer the genomes, right. So, what is shown here in this slide is some of the uh, uh, approaches people have used to create, you know, or engineer the genome. We discussed Cray enzyme, which originally was, you know, described in a bacterial, uh, bacteriophage or bacterial system, and how that can be used for, you know, deleting the gene in the mouse. And then we came and looked at the hybrid restriction enzyme called ZFNs, and then we looked at the recent development that is CRISPR-Cas9, and then we also discussed how this CRISPR-Cas9 Cas9 has helped in editing the genome at least as a clinical trial in humans, right. There are many other such advancements, some of them we are going to discuss today are the following. One is in early 1986, people have you know started engineering the plant genome and that is done probably uh, you know it is covered widely in your textbook called uh, you know the TI vector and so on. So, it is kind of a um, uh, delivery vehicle like the way we use plasmids and these are agrobacterium which are able to in fact the uh, introduce the DNA into the plant cells at least in the culture then we can you know grow a plant out of it. That is the very first step in introducing the DNA into the plants, but now we have a variety of uh, you know approach by which you are able to you know kind of engineer the genome or affect the way the genome functions. One such uh, very tall discovery that led to the Nobel Prize was called as uh, RNAi or RNA interference, which was first introduced in studying um, the gene function in, in a very popular model system called C. elegans. It is a worm, uh, it is a nematode, Sanaharabitid C. elegans. And people have used this model to understand how the development takes place and how the genes regulate development. So, this is called as RNAi because you know you create a kind of a short RNA that, that can affect the function of a given gene, right. And then of course, a very similar powerful tool has come especially in again understanding the development of another model system zebrafish which is called the Morphilonos and, and both these systems have uh, not restricted its applicability only to these systems, but you know you can go and use it in wide variety of systems and that is something that we are going to discuss. Let us first look into how this RNAi system functions. So, the RNAi is uh, a you know a way by which you are able to silence a gene. When you say silence, it is not that you are preventing the expression of the gene, but you are doing something that equivalent to almost the gene is not being expressed. So, the way we do is we use RNA to interfere in the function of the gene and, and, and it is you know as it is known as RNA interference. So, in short it people call us RNAi. So, what is that? So, this is one of the mechanisms by which our own system is able to regulate the half life of a variety of mRNA. For example, you know for everything you know if you look into the system you, if you have a uh, if you have driven a two wheeler or a four wheeler which are automobiles you have you know what is called as gearbox you know you change the gear and then you have accelerator you are able to go fast. So, whenever you need you can go fast or you need more power then you go to you know uh, shift to gear 1 or 2 and then you are able to give more power. At the same time you have another system to brake stop the vehicle. So, you have to have all these controls exactly the same way the cell is able to uh, regulate the gene when you have more amount of protein for a given gene how do you do it? There are very various ways one you can make the gene to make more copies of the RNA. So, in a given um, say one minute you make 100 copies of messenger RNA right this is one way. The other way is let the mRNA stay for longer therefore, they can make more amount of protein because everything has a half life, the RNA has a half life, protein has a half life. 
So, you make the RNA to live longer therefore, even with 100 you know uh, RNA you are able to make more protein because uh, this is another way of doing it. So, the other exactly the similar mechanism can be used to regulate it. You have made RNAs and the RNA are being converted into protein, but now you have to shut it down. You do not want protein to be there. So, what way you can do? You can degrade the protein or you can make it inactive. But if even if you do that, if RNA is there, it is going to continue to make the protein, right. So, what way you can do that? Even if you shut down the gene, the RNA is going to be there. So, what way you can do? You have to degrade the RNA. So, how will you make it specific? Only certain RNAs are degraded and so on. So, the, our system has you know small RNAs which go and target a given set of messenger RNAs and that targeting meaning it identifies sequence it goes and binds and helps the system to degrade those RNA that have the complementary sequence. So, that is what called as micro RNAs or MARNAs that are present in your system that is shown in the schematic. So, you have this RNA is called as miRNA or micro RNA which are you know single stranded RNA that are obviously which are made, but they have sequence that are complementary. So, therefore, they can fold back form such kind of base pairing like a loop and these come out of the nucleus to the cytoplasm where there are enzymes like Dicer and risk complex and many other which we can look into the details when we share the you know links for you which you know sort of cleaves them and make small segment of RNA like what you see here. So, these 20, 25 base um, sequences you know go and bind to most often the untranslated region of the you know RNAs messengers the 3 prime untranslated. So, when they go and bind they have two distinct function one for example, now when they bind like this something like what is shown here. Now, this can result in you know the translation arrest. Now, the RNA is not being translated, the RNA is there, but they are not allowed to translate. The cell now gets the messenger uh, kind of message that when this micro RNA comes when they are cleaved and small RNAs are being made and they go and bind and then prevent the um, translation of the protein. So, you are able to block the translation. The other you know function of these such um, RNA is whenever there is a, the complementarity between the short RNA and the target mRNA is large like what is shown here extensive, then what happens that it goes and form, form this kind of a duplex with the RNA and then you have of course, enzymes which go and recognize this such duplex and then degrade the RNA. So, mRNA is being degraded. So, this is the way you can do that. So, what people have done is that to look for you know RNA is that you can make something like this for a given gene and introduce inside the cell or animal and then using our own machinery to degrade the RNA, you can degrade the RNA that you want to degrade. Therefore, the cell is almost like not having the protein. So, the only difference in here is this is not that the knockdown what do you call here that is by degrading the messenger, it is not 100 percent right. It can be 50 percent, 60 percent, 80 percent, 90 percent but never be 100 percent. But still it is good enough because even if you have depleted a cell of a given protein up to 90 percent that is almost not having that protein. So, you can see a given phenotype. So, that is the advantage of the system. So, what is interesting that you may find is that there are about you know more than you know 1000 genes that make this mRNA right. And they target about 60 percent of our genes that are there. So, it says that the majority of the genes that we have whose you know RNA their stability their half life whether it is translated or not translated is regulated by such short RNA called as micro RNA right. So, and where are these micro RNA comes from or miRNA comes from? They come from a variety of source it could be simply a small segment of your intron of any other gene which is spliced out. Now, we believe normally the textbook says the intronic region is spliced out, but we never bother about what possible function it has. It looks like such spliced out RNAs could also function as a regulatory RNA and you know it is it is there are it is present in a wide variety of system not restricted to only to you know, humans right. 
So, that is one uh, information. So, let us see how we can do that. So, we can use the same machinery this the you have a machinery in the cell which identifies such RNA duplex you know short RNA bound to an mRNA therefore, it can degrade. So, what you need to do is if you can provide the short you know RNA inside you are able to mean regulate the level of that particular messenger that is what people have done. So, one way to do is you can for example, make a plasmid which expresses you know a, a, like a hairpin loop like you know sequence which are specific to for example, a given gene transcript right. So, our when you make this and introduce inside the cell or you make the cells to make this then the one of the strands that is how the system functions goes and forms a you know complementary base pairing with a target RNA and then of course, because it is such kind of a duplex are recognized by the machinery and they are being removed. So, we are using the same machinery that otherwise regulates the normal function of the gene. So, in this way we can target any of this you can make either a duplex of the RNA which is you know RNA duplex and introduce inside the organism or the cell the RNA is targeted or you can make this kind of constructs which keep on making such R duplex and then you know the cell is able to degrade the target sequence right. So, this again has a wider applicability because you know for example, what is shown here is one of the papers that that has shown that you know in a, a given tumor you can see this is a mouse model with the tumor that is growing because you can you know uh, you know place few cells that have the tumorogenicity and the tumor grows in the animal. So, if you want to really test is there any drug that can regulate this or regress the growth of the tumor then you can use this model and that is what they have shown. For example, you know there are two different um, RNAi construct meaning the different RNA target they looked at and they delivered this RNAi duplex into the tumors and they found that if you inactivate a given gene you know in the system and the animal is not developing such big tumor as you have seen otherwise right. In other words, if you can target a specific gene and block its expression using this method RNAi you are able to control the growth of the tumor right. So, it has a tremendous potential. Now, what it says now you can pack this RNA duplex into certain chemical um, capsid like balls and you can target it to wherever you have the tumor and if they are delivered there then that is going to inactivate the gene by degrading the RNA that are being made as a result the cell will not grow into tumor or you can regress. So, this along with the other combinational therapy you will have a better uh, control over treatment right. So, that that has the potential. So, this is one way you can do. The advantage is that it is very simple you can you can make you can target any gene that you want because all you need to make is a small segment of the RNA either uh, the duplex or the SHRNA that you make. So, much easier and it also allowed people to look at um, knock down a large number of genes. In fact, we have now libraries for human all the genes for which you know you want to study you have libraries of the RNA i. So, simply select what you want and you can knock down and then study. This also has application in other um, field for example, you can engineer plants to make you know double stranded RNA for a gene that is not present in the plant, but in the uh, parasites or nematode that infect plants right. One of the examples that is shown here has come from our own institute from IIT Kanpur wherein they have engineered the plant such that it makes a double stranded RNA for a gene that is normally critical for the development of parasitic you know uh, young ones the larval forms. So, they are the one that infect the plant and what is shown here you can see in this left side is that this is a root of a plant which is heavily infested with the parasite. So, the parasite gets in and they form these nodules as a result the plant do not grow well it is infection. But if you can make the plant to make a double stranded RNA for you know some of the genes that are critical for the development of the worm the nem nematode the parasites then what happen this even if you now infect the plant with these nematodes because the the, the, the nematodes eat the plant cells for their survival as a result the double strand RNA gets into their gut and that can sort of you know trigger a systemic 
uh, you know kind of a silencing of the gene as a result the nematodes do not grow and, and, and therefore, the infection is minimized. So, these are some of the applications really powerful applications using the RNAi. These techniques that we spoke about the RNAi and others, um, these are you know some of them that are very specific to the genes because you want to delete the gene that you want or mutate a gene that you want or alter the gene that you want. But there are also other methods people have used um, which are not target specific, but phenotype specific meaning I am looking into uh, a function say for example, vision uh, using drosophila model. So, what I do? I expose the fly to a chemical what is shown here is this uh, ethyl methanosulfonate EMS they call it. And if you expose the animal to this chemical and this chemical is known to cause mutation, but normally these are base changes. So, what happens this uh, chemical especially with guanine it interacts with and then it makes what is called as uh, O ethyl guanine it is the way it is changed. As a result what happens when this gets changed now this G no longer pairs with G, but it can pair with T. So, if you have a cell in which such kind of modification took place and that cell is dividing then what happens now this ethyl guanine now sort of mimic the base pairing as if it is A and the new strand that is being made will have T in place of you know C. So, in that way you are able to change the base and if it happens to be a region where there is a codon and the codon is altered then you are going to have a different amino acid. If it is a region where you have some transcription factor is going to bind, so it may not bind and things like that. So, you are creating mutation randomly and you are going to screen a large number of progeny the uh, that come out and then look at the phenotype and if they have a desirable phenotype like for example, loss of vision then you are going to look at where this mutation took place and then you can go back and map you know the genome right. So, this is this is other much simpler method people have used right. So, there are uh, ways what we discussed is how a genetics the forward genetics and then we have come to genomics we understood large number of genes and that you know call it as a genomics wherein you know every gene you do not know what is the function you knock out and look at the function. Now, what you are going to do discuss is you know the topic that is functional genomic how this has led to what is called as understanding the function the entire you know genes that are present in the, the genome as to what function they do. So, genetics just let us look into this genetics versus genomics the genetics is a study of gene function. So, normally you know if you look into the classic Morgan model you have looked at the phenotype and try to map it to a region of the genome and then find the gene and then say this is what it is. Genomics has changed the way because now you have understood all the genes as to how many genes are there, what kind of protein it can code for, but what you do not know is what is the function. A transcription factor may be helping you either to digest a product or it can be in your vision or it could be something else. So, the protein per se does not say what is the final function in terms of phenotype. For that what do you do? You delete the gene and look at the phenotype right. So, this is genotype to phenotype that was possible you know from genomics point of view. But still there are challenges. So, how are you going to assay like you know I do not know when I find a new gene using genomic approach. Now, I delete it, but I need to assay the function of it. So, I may not be able to see everything at the as a phenotype level. For example, a gene is involved in cell division and I knock out that gene. So, I will never see the phenotype because this every time you delete the gene the cell will not survive because it cannot divide. So, I in this approach even if I create a knockout or whatever it is, it is not going to help me in dissecting this. So, you have to have powerful assays to understand the variety of functions. So, here the assay is the assay is dedicated to particular function for example, growth cell division or the reverse of it. What are the genes that help in the cell death right. So, all our cells have a finite division after that they cease to you know divide and they die. So, there are now we know that there are genes that trigger cell death or pro apoptotic protein. So, what are these proteins? What are the genes? How do you screen for it right? So, it depends on what kind of assays. So, that is what called as functional genomics determine function of all genes in the genome. So, one assay is not going to help you to screen the function of all the genes. 
So, we are going to look into some hypothetical projects. I am going to show you then some examples from the literature how people have used this functional genomics approach to understand the function of a large number of genes, but all of them function in one particular pathway. Let us say our project is to identify all genes involved in mitosis cell division, right. We are all growing because of mitosis. If you have a wound cut in your body, it gets you know filled up and heal is because of mitosis. So, everything you know you need mitosis right. So, let us see. So, how will you identify all the genes that are there in your genome that help in mitosis right. The approach is you have now again you have to go for appropriate approach there are we discussed a variety of approach we can use it for genomic applications. So, let us look into a simple approach RNAi because human mitosis we are going to study and then we have the uh, SI RNA duplex for every gene that our genome has. So, I have the tools. So, I am going to introduce this double uh, duplex into the cell as a result what would happen is that you know whatever RNA that carries this segment will be degraded. So, the, the therefore, the protein in the cell would go down and if they are very critical for the function that function is last. So, you can use a large number of genes for this screen because simply I have to you know put them into the cell. Second, this requires live cells because I am studying a process which cannot be studied in a dead cell in the sense I am talking about cell division. So, I have to look at cells that divide. So, that division is a process that I am going to score for. So, I have should be able to look at cells that are live. So, how will you do? So, normally when you talk about microscopy, it is difficult to you know stain cells unless you have fixed them and you are using some antibody and so on. So, therefore, you have to come up with ways. So, people have now we can use is called as fluorescent proteins. These are proteins that are normally present in marine animals which live in conditions wherein it is not that bright. They emit light kind of fluorescence protein these are called a GFP and people have engineered this GFP to make you know protein to fluoresce in different colors for example, there could be RFP red fluorescence protein, yellow fluorescence protein and so on. So, what I can do is that I can use a protein which are normally present in your cell such that the protein is fused to now GFP. So, now the fused protein would do the function of whatever the function the protein is able to do, but it also would fluoresce right. So, it will tell you where the protein is. Say suppose if I am using a protein that binds to the spindle you know the fiber that bind to the chromosome and pull you must have studied in, in your textbook. If that spindle forming protein as GFP it would look something like this. So, the spindle would fluoresce then I can see that cell and I say okay, this is in this particular cell division or not dividing at all. So, I am able to analyze right. What is the other important element? I should be able to automate. So, I am looking at some 40,000 genes to screen. So, any one or hundreds of them could be involved in the process, but I cannot you know study this manually. If I have to study the function of every one gene out of that 40,000 for this particular process, I will be spending hours and hours with just for one gene to you know because itself takes about 24 hours to divide. So, at the maximum I can finish in 2 days or 3 days I can confirm that one gene whether it is involved or not involved. So, it is not possible because you cannot spend without you know basically sleeping sitting at the microscope and observing it is difficult tedious process. So, you have to have high throughput meaning you should be able to look into large number of samples at the same time it is automated meaning you do not sit there a machine does that right. So, this this is doable because you know you can have plates that you know you have 96 wells for example, what is shown here, but you can go much close to 400 or so. And each one you have seeded some cells and then in each one of the well you have given the SIRNA for a given gene. So, in one plate I am screening for 96 you know genes likewise I can you know scale up the reaction. Then you have a system in which you know you are able to analyze the cell, but not by yourself the computer does. So, you are given the patterns and there are algorithms that looks at the imaging pattern because you are going to look at the cell from the fluorescence and the, the algorithm would look at the you know the kind of patterns that the fluorescent gives and it will call okay this cell did 
enter mitosis or it did not exit mitosis, right. So, this way we are able to analyze and tell what are the genes that are affecting the mitosis or not affecting the mitosis. Obviously, the genes that are not affecting the mitosis is going to be much larger because they have variety of function. But then you are going to have a list of 100 genes or whatever that are involved in the mitotic function. So, that is the screen that we use. Let us look into the flow chart, how does it do? So, the step 1, I establish a model system to assay the, the, the process of cell division. So, what do you do? You know you have a cell line in which you have engineered the cell line such that it is going to express a protein which binds to for example, the tubulin, um, the spindle microtubule marker and for example, histone which is a marker for the chromosome because the histones are basic protein bound to the DNA. So, what you are seeing here beautifully is that these are the, the red ones are the chromosomes and the green ones are the spindle that are pulling the chromosome to the two things. So, if I can make the computer to find this pattern in a if the computer was you know through microscope is looking at cells for 24 hours or 36 hours. If that cell has shown this pattern that means that is able to you know divide that is what it is the system is able to score it right. And, and you are able to culture the cells in this kind of plate I described and then you are going to what you do is that this is a process it is not a snapshot you are going to look at the cell for a period of 36 hours because it is a division it is normally it is about 24 to 30 hours it might a cell might divide. So, you are going to look at that. So, the computer has to the camera the microscope has to image it at the intervals for example, every 10 minutes once it will take a snap. So, when you have that kind of snap taken and then you know you run it in a continuous way then it will look like it is a movie and that image can be used for you know deciphering whether a cell has entered mitosis or is exited mitosis or it is not at all entering or not at all exiting. So, that that is easy to do in that way. So, then you have there are other challenges for example, when you have 96 well plate then you want to add medium then you cannot take pipette the handle pipette keep on adding in one because then uh, when will you finish uh, dispensing all the liquid that is not you know. So, you have to have you know either robotic workstations or pipettes that can dispense at the same time to either you know 9 wells, 8 wells or 16 wells whatever it is right. So, that that again helps and then you have for example, a workstation which you know completely takes care of uh, you know imaging at every interval and processing it and telling you all these things. So, these are all doable and with this you will be able to at the end of 2 days, 3 days you will be able to call as to how many genes possibly affect mitosis. This is a landmark paper which used one such approach using RNAi screen to identify what you call as genes involved in mitosis cell division. So, you can see that this paper came in nature in 2010 it says phenotypic profiling of human genome by time lapse microscopy reveals cell division genes what is called as human genome. So, it looked at every gene almost and its function in cell division. So, now it is now what we had discussed earlier is that you, you are looking at a phenotype going to the gene through genomic approach you identify all the genes now you want to delete the gene and look at function. Now, we are not looking at just one gene we are looking at every gene by using a high throughput screening you know automated process to identify set of genes involved in a given function right. So, you have to come up with assays and so on. So, they have screened close to 22,000 human genes and then then they found that 1249 genes SIR and exhibit mitotic phenotype and then 572 genes exhibited mitotic phenotype with you know uh, meaning two different SIR and A you can use and so on. Let us not get into that, but these are validations right. Once you found some positive hits then you are going to validate and indeed that is the case and so on. So, these are some of the images that are shown you can see that these are time lapse that is uh, 21 uh, 48 hours and you can see that from you know 25 minutes 46 minutes 47 47 54 and so on and they are showing how beautifully the cell is dividing you can see that if you look at very carefully you have the histone that is marking the chromosome you have a spindle how the cells divide so that is a normal process but in these conditions where you are knocked down certain genes that like shown here OGG or SNP or whatever it is 
then the process is altered. Either it is not entering mitosis or the cell division is not proper. You can see that phenotype that where in the cells are not properly dividing, they, they are clumped together and it is not dividing. That pretty much tells you that you know the loss of this gene results in a phenotype that is not ideal for mitosis. So, here you went with an approach without really bothering about which gene and at the end of the screen you are able to identify hundreds of genes that are involved in the process. So, that is you know high throughput process. Now, I am going to talk about another such approach. Again it is considered to be a landmark discovery wherein they identified human genes or rather the protein coded by the genes helping the influenza virus to enter our human cells. So, the virus does not just enter on its own, there are some it uses some of our own machinery to survive and infect our cells. So, if we can identify those proteins, then it we can come up with a better therapeutic or in, in preventive measures that is that is that is the you know paper here they identified genes that help in this process. How did they do? Again they used the automated process. Let us not get into all the details, but what is shown here is that a process that you have uh, a viral particle you know that gets into the cell and then again it makes its own copies and again goes and infects and so on. So, what they have done is they again use the same approach meaning you have a system wherein you are introducing the virus and looking at how it gets into the cell again makes copies of itself and then goes and does one more round of infection using time lapse videography. And then on the top of it they have you know looked at you know genes that affect this process. Now, you go on knocking out every gene each one after the other or high throughput screen and see in which we in, in when you knock out a given gene or which are the genes when you knock down, then this process of infection is altered right. So, they use this very similar approach of uh, image processing to identify genes and they are able to tell that it uses a machinery which is normally the cell uses to clear the abnormal proteins that are made in the in the in the cell. So, it uses that machinery hijacks that for its own benefit and is able to multiply and so on. So, that is you know um, way they have done. So, again just to show a flow chart that you have had a system wherein you have large number of you know what is called the multi well plates, you have seeded the cells, you have seeded the virus, you have ways to image certain events there and then the computer scores these images and tells you whether the infection is proper, whether the, pro the virus is able to replicate and make more particle or not. With that you are able to target the genes that help in this process. So, that is that is the way it is done. So, again these are using RNAi as I said the knockdown of the gene is done by duplex that people use and this RNA screen is something that now is routinely done and I just give this RNA screen this is a PubMed search and you will find that already when I say screen it is not individual RNA or individual gene. You are talking about you know screening for a particular process using thousands of constructs that knock out thousands of genes. So, when you see that there are already 700 papers and you can see here on the right side it this histogram only talks about how you know, the number of papers that use this RNA screen as increasing by every year then you can see that this is you know probably 2017 or no, sorry 16 and this is when probably these approaches came. You find that the number of papers goes up that means that this technique is being refined and more and more groups are using it because it is very desirable to find the screen right. So, that really helps us to identify that is what it is about RNAi and because of its simplicity and the power you know it to identify genes whose function is last you know this discovery led to the award of Nobel Prize to you know, Fire and Mellow and uh, that is a really tremendous application in that. Um, so, we are going to go and look at another such approach which is uh, called as Morphil you know. so, again it is a DNA sequence based knockout strategy originally you know described for zebra fish let us see what it is. These morphilinos are nothing but oligos you know these are synthetic single stranded DNA, but these you know the backbone of the, the, the DNA that are made are modified such that you know it is a stable otherwise it may be degraded and these are antisense meaning they are complementary to given RNA 
and they are have the efficiency to knock down the gene expression meaning it goes and forms a duplex like what is shown here and this is your RNA and this is your morphilino this is nothing but an oligo we are having a modified 5 prime end and then you have this basis ok. So, they all form base pairs just like that right and they have the same standard nuclear basis adenine, cytosine, guanine but there are changes like what is shown here these are non ionic phosphor this, this basically makes this um, nucleic acid to survive in the condition because your cell otherwise would you know degrade them right. And this is this assay system with which people have developed this and validated it because these are zebra fish these are animals that lay egg unfertilized egg and sperm in the medium water and the fertilization takes place outside and you can see from in 0 meaning just fertilized to the formation of the young ones to the adult happens outside therefore, you can follow the development you know, you know under a microscope unlike for example, mouse this is the development happens within the system uh, uterus then you cannot follow but here it is external therefore, if you really want to study the genes that are involved in the early development this is one of the best models because it is vertebrate and external fertilization external development. And the entire process is translucent you do not need any um, color fluorescent protein and all. So, you can see that these are bright field imaging just you are looking at under microscope you are able to see the all the process you can see that this is animal pole and you have the cells dividing and so on. So, then this embryo is coming out and you can see that people have used this. So, if you are looking at genes that are involved in developmental process all you have to do is take these oligos and then inject into the egg and see whether the process is happening or hampered. If the gene is critical for the process then the RNA rather then it is going to go and form a duplex that will not be translated. So, you will not have the protein made. So, the, the process will be hampered. On the other hand if that is not involved in the process the process would continue. The question is how does this oligo or the morpholino really affect the gene or the RNA from splicing. There are two ways it can do for example, it can even affect the splicing of the RNA. So, what is known is that uh, you must have studied in your textbook that when you have a gene which has multiple exons the intron sequence should be removed. What is shown here here that there are protein that comes and binds and then cleave the RNA such that the intronic region is removed. So, when you have this morpholinos targeting to that kind of a sequence where you have the intron exon boundaries then what would happen is that it would prevent the formation of the spliceosomes the complex that help in the splicing of the mRNA. So, when that happens the RNA will not be cleaved and some of the factors is still bound to the RNA and the RNA will never come to the cytoplasm as a result you know this is not going to be you know functional because it will not make any protein. The other process is that that you can make the morphinone such that you know you have this um, ribosome binding to the RNA and then reading and then you have the peptide being made in translation process. So, you can make morphinone such that the assembly of the large ribosome is hampered you make it to the 5 prime end of the RNA where the assembly takes place therefore, you prevent the translation. So, if in, in both the approach basically your, your the, the end result is that the protein is not made it is as good as not having the gene. So, that is how you do. I am going to show you some examples again how people have used this approach to identify genes involved in certain developmental events. You must have seen that there are developmental events called as craniofacial morphogenesis meaning when you are you know the embryo is developing you have this skull which even forms the roof of your mouth and other part. These are very uh, tightly regulated development process there are people who have deformity in the development as a result they have a defect because it again is uh, because of some genetic defect that they have. So, what are the genes that are involved in such process right. So, this study here what is shown in the screen here they have looked at a large number of genes they have used morphilinos to knock you know sort of affect the function of the gene and looked at how what are the genes that affect the skeletal the craniofacial development because these are all conserved genes because the same genes that functions um, the similar way in human as well. So, you can see these are uninjected embryos they are normal you have the eye and then you have this the skull coming up 
And this is one such gene when you lose then the you know the skull is not being formed well. So, in this way we are able to quickly come up with genes that are involved in this process you know. So, that in fact you know there are several implications I will show you one more example. In fact, this paper used the zebrafish model to understand you know a gene which is even involved in human development and function. For example, this particular gene called FAN1 mutation in the gene causes uh, interstitial nephritis some defect in the kidney function and it is genetic mutation it is a severe condition affecting the human. And, and they found some mutation, but they, they were not sure how does it really this gene or its or its its mutation affect a kidney function. So, they went to this um, in fact, uh, they started with the zebrafish model they have used a morphinolose to knock out the gene and looked at how the kidney being developed or function and they are able to validate and show that the same gene is involved in human as well as in zebrafish in the same function that is how the kidney functions right. So, that is the power of these uh, uh, approaches here your approach is unbiased you are not looking at any gene you are looking at every gene every end product is what is the functional outcome in regard to kidney or regard to skeletal development regard to mitosis you are looking at the process and you are look, looking at all the genes that are involved in the process. So, you are able to identify all the genes involved in that particular process. So, that is pretty much um, the end of the functional genomics and uh, we will end here and then we will again look into some other analysis the especially on how you can look at the expression of the genes because so far you are looking at how you delete the genes and how do you engineer the genome or destabilize the RNA and how the function is affected. In the next lecture we will look into how we can um, look at the expression patterns, expression profiles of various genes in a process.